worship the King, O oh, glorious above, and gratefully sing His wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the Ancient of Days, pavilion in splendor and girded with praise. Oh, tell of His might, O oh, sing of His grace, whose robe is the light, whose canopy space, His chariots of wrath, the deep thunder clouds form, and dark is His path on the wings of the storm. Thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the air, it shines in the light. It streams from the hills, it descends to the plain, and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. Frail children of dust and feeble as frail, in thee do we trust, nor find thee to fail. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end, our Maker, Defender, Redeemer, and Friend. Ain't that a good song? Yeah, the line, it just here's you. You can remember this line, the, the fourth verse: "Frail children of dust and feeble as frail." That's a good word right there. Good line. Remember that about yourself and trust in God. All right. Uh, one more, turn over to uh, page 32, and we'll sing another, as church, as Porky would say, we will sing another big church song. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah we're, Porky, Porky says it's a big church song, we're breaking out the, the choir robes now. <laughs> You, do you know this one? No, but I'll follow you. <laughs> okay. Well, even our piano player doesn't know this one. It should be interesting. <laughs> That's close enough. Immortal, invisible, God only wise, in light inaccessible, hid from our eyes. Most blessed, most glorious, the Ancient of Days, Almighty, victorious, Thy great name we praise. Unresting, unhasting, and silent as light, nor wanting, nor wasting, Thou rulest in might. Thy justice like mountains high soaring above, Thy clouds which are fountains of goodness and love. To all life Thou givest, to both great and small, In all life Thou livest, the truest life all. We blossom and flourish as heavens on the tree, and wither and perish, but not changeth thee. Great Father of glory, pure Father of light, thine angels adore thee, all veiling their sight. All praise we would render, O oh, help us to see. Tis only the splendor of light hideth thee. Well, everybody amen real big and loud at that. Nobody knows that but me. All right, well, we learned a new song tonight. We sang, we sang it this morning. Hang on. Let me see, find out which number it is. And uh, we'll, we'll end with this. 
Let's see, 444. We sang it this morning, but a great, a great tune, man. This is a good song. 446 is another version that we know also, but turn to 444 if you know it, sing it. Let's take it. Let's take it slow. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy, His child, and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of. Proclaim it, his child, and forever I am. Redeemed and so happy in Jesus, no language my rapture can tell. I know that the light of his presence with me doth continually dwell. Redeemed. by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it ever I am. I think of my blessed Redeemer. I think of Him all the day long. It's like I cannot be silent, His love is the theme of my song. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy, His child and forever. That's a good song. All right. Well, if you would, turn with me in your Bibles to Jane. Okay, it's time for our special music. And I don't know who it is, so whoever it is, come and sing. Thank, J looks like Jama is coming to sing. So. Christ, only Christ, who 
gives life more abundant, and he calls from Calvary. It was there on Calvary, God's dear Son. While there's time, don't delay. Place your faith in Christ Jesus. Turn your eyes now to Calvary. While the Spirit's clear voice can be heard softly pleading, give your life to Jesus now. Trusting faith is the way to have life everlasting and he calls from Calvary. It was there on Calvary God's dear Son laid down His life for you. While there's time, don't delay. Place your faith in Christ Jesus. Turn your eyes now to Calvary. Thank you. I miss my microphone. Y'all ever had one of those days? I just can't seem to get settled down here. So I, I'm a little off kilter because our, our song leaders. Oh, wait. Hey, Crystal, will you go into the office and get my notes out of the printer? Okay, so uh, uh, <laughs> the, the sermon's got to get better from here. So uh, I wasn't supposed to lead singing, but Elijah, I, by the way, I hope Elijah's watching this. He's probably the sorriest person that I know, and we will miss Elijah in heaven. But uh, <laughs> so it, the, the serious note, though, I got a, a uh, call and then a text and it back and forth. I'd re last week, I had asked Mike Satterfield to preach tonight. Well, Mike wasn't here this morning. I thought that was unusual that I asked him to preach. He wasn't here this morning and got a call from his nephew um, that Mike had fallen this morning on kind of getting ready for church. On his way to church, fell on the patio out there. They wound up taking him to the hospital, and he is right now uh, in surgery having a hip replacement. So we need to remember Mike Satterfield at a prayer. So I, I had... Uh, originally, I was not going to preach. He's going to let Mike preach, but uh, he, you know those sorts of things happen. And uh, we, Mike, this actually he's fallen a couple times here recently, so we sure need to be in prayer for Mike. And especially, you know, since he has uh, diabetes, that'll make healing a little more difficult. So be in prayer for Mike this evening. And what I'd like to do is just take a second for Ken tonight. And since he is in surgery right now, maybe just take a second and pray for him. And so uh, after that, I'm going to be in James chapter 2, verse 1. And after we pray, then we'll look at what God has to say to us tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, though, this evening. Heavenly Father, thank you for tonight. We thank you for the chance to gather here. We thank you for your word and your spirit. Thank you for those who are here. And Lord, however imperfectly we praise you, we seek to do that tonight. And uh, Lord, I'm, uh, I, I'm the the best example of one who does it imperfectly and but lord we want to worship you and so lord help us do that tonight and father i pray that you'd be with mike and the doctors and the nurses and the medicine and the surgery and all that's entailed and i pray that you'd help him and that you'd heal him 
And Father, I pray that through his life and through this, uh, through this bit of trial, that Jesus Christ would be exalted in his life and that he could share Jesus with those around him. And Father, I pray that you'd help us do that tonight, that we could exalt Jesus Christ in all that we say and do. And Father, I thank you for Jesus. And I thank you that while we are weak, he is strong. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. What? Oh, great. Well, all right. We're going to... We're, I might have even brought him in here. Uh, let's hang on just a hang on just a second. All right. Well, we'll do the best we can here. James, I, I'm going to be in James chapter two, verse one. This is uh, the title of tonight's sermon. Is this living to please the crowd? That's the title of the sermon. Or for an alternate title, you can choose this, Middle School Christianity. That's probably a pretty good example of this. Uh, when you get to middle school, or at least I did, I think this is pretty common for most folks uh, that uh, growing up today as well. When you get to middle school, about that time anyway, you start having to try to figure out who you are and where you fit into life. And so you start trying to, you know, you, that's when you start at some point trying to figure out what you want to wear, independent of what your mom bought you. You start trying to figure out what you want to wear and how you're going to fix your hair. And there is at least one or two awkward years where you have a school photo with a really, really terrible haircut and terrible outfit on because you got to pick it out instead of your mom that time. Well, in Christianity, some people never seem to get past that mode of trying to impress everybody else around them with their faith. And James talks about that, James chapter 2, verse 1, and we'll look at some other verses as we go, but verse 1 says this, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, help us tonight as we look into your word. Help us to listen, help us to learn, help us to grow. Help us to be more like Jesus and less like the old person we used to be. If somebody is lost, let tonight be the night they come to know you as Lord and Savior. Father, help us to hear a word from you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. My brethren, he is speaking to believers, all right? This is a message for Christians. This is not to lost people. That's another message for another day. This is a message to lost people. And he says, my brethren, you, you believers, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect to persons. Now my plan, Lord willing, is to begin on Sunday nights in the next few weeks a sermon series on faith. And we're going to be talking about that but this sort of leads into that. This was a separate sermon I've been working on, but it leads into that. He says, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, Lord of glory, with respect to persons. He is speaking here about the way you live out your faith in Jesus Christ. Each of us, if we're believers, has a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We have placed our faith in Him, our trust in Him. We believe that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and we have trusted Him for our eternal life. And as you do that, you have to live out that faith. And so he says, as you're living out your faith, don't do it with respect of persons. Now, I'm going to read you uh, the message, which is a terrible translation. Don't go by the, that translation. Don't read it. It's a terrible translation, but tonight we're going to use this just to give you a, sort of a down-home folksy idea of what we're talking about. Here's the way that the message translates this. It says this, My dear friends, do not let public opinion influence how you live out our glorious Christ-originated faith. Now, I don't think that's a great word-for-word -word translation because it's not my dear friends, it's brothers and sisters in Christ. That's a little different, isn't it? But you get the idea. He is speaking here, James is speaking here about living out your faith so as to please those around you. So here's the rule. Two parts to it. Here's the rule. Don't live your faith based on what you think of others. And especially here, 
don't live out your faith based on what others think of you. Because he says in verse 2, But if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and then there come also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou here, or sit here under my footstool. Are you not then partial? So he is speaking here about those who uh, would take some... This, in this case, he's talking about the rich versus the poor. And somebody that is wealthy comes into your church and you treat them really well. And somebody poor that comes into your church and instead the rich person comes in and you say, Here, you get the best seat in the house. And a poor person comes in and you say to them, I tell you what, there's really not room. Why don't you stand there in the back? Well, that's one application of this. The truth is, we can do that. We can show partiality, is the phrase he uses there, respect of persons. We can show partiality in a many, many uh, number of ways, can't we? We can show partiality for rich and poor. We can show partiality for men and women. We can show partiality for black and white. We can show partiality for green and purple and red and blue. When people come to church, everybody ought to be welcome into the presence of Jesus Christ, every person. And it doesn't matter how much money is in their pocket. It doesn't matter about the color of their skin. None of those things matter when it comes to Jesus. All of us are sinners, and all of us are going to be saved the same way. If you're going to be saved, it's through Jesus Christ. He talks about, uh, he says there in... Uh, verse 1 respect of persons it's favoring an individual it's showing partiality and verse 9 says this look at listen to verse 9 but if you have respect to persons you commit sin respect to persons is not just unwise or unfair it is sin you hear that sinful to treat some people better than others. Now, as you look at this passage, you can, you can look at it from this angle, from how you feel about other people. But really, when he talks about it, he's talking about how you think other people feel about you. Because he says the rich person comes in, what do you do? You give them the best seat in the house. You treat them better than everybody else. You are trying to win the favor and the opinion of the rich person. Now you can fill that in the blank with whatever type of person you're showing partiality to. But what he's getting at is this. When you and I try to win the favor of others, we are committing sin. When we live out our faith and we're simply trying to please somebody else and win their favor, we're sinning. Galatians 1.10 says this, For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Acts 5.29, Peter says this, Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Ephesians 6.6 6 says this, Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, Doing the will of God from the heart. There is verse after verse after verse in Scripture that tells us this. Our uh, burning passion and desire ought to be to live a life that is pleasing to Jesus Christ. That should be the driving force of our life. We ought to live a life that wins the favor of Jesus. That pleases Him. Now, I don't mean to imply that you have to live by the rules or Jesus doesn't love you. That's not what I'm saying. No, remember this. Romans 5, 8 said, God commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus loved you when you were a sinner. And you were lost, He loved you. He certainly loves you now if you're a believer in Him. This is not trying to earn salvation or curry the favor of God in some way. This is simply following God, being obedient to His Word, living a life that honors and pleases Jesus. That, that's what he talks about. He talks about sin, but then he, he also talks about standards. Verse 4 says this, 
Are you not then partial in yourselves and are become judges of evil thoughts? So if you are showing favor to one person over another person, you are showing partiality and you become judges of evil thoughts. What happens is this. When we live a life and we're trying to please other people in life, we are no longer living by God's standards. I'm going to tell you why I say that. Jesus says this in John 7, 24, Judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. That's Jesus' command to us. Don't judge by the outward appearance. Judge by righteous judgment. Romans 2, 11 says this, For there is no respect of persons with God. Did you all know that? God loves every person equally, just as much. He loves He loves the lost person just as much as He loves the Christian. He loves the woman just as much as He loves the man. He loves the black person just as much as He loves the white person. He loves the poor person and the rich person. He doesn't love any of them any more than He loves the others. He loves all of them. Jesus Christ died for everyone. God loves everybody and He loves them all equally. Now here's what happens. When you're trying to please the world, and I'm, let me be blunt for just a minute, just straight with you. There are plenty of churches that try to win the world by being like the world. They try to use the, the language the world uses. They try to wear the clothes that the world cherishes. Uh, they, they, try, they try every way in the world to win the world by being like the world. Friend, you will never win the world by being like them. We're not trying to win the world by being like the world. We're trying to win the world by being like Christ. That's how you win the world. Now, you're never going to win the world, but you can win some. When you no longer use God's standard by how you live your life and how you run your church and how you practice your faith, when you no longer use God's standard, what you've done is you have now made yourself a victim to the world's standards. And I'm going to tell you something. The world's standards shift and change all the time. There was a time when the world thought that... uh, that homosexuality was a sin, then that changed. There was a world, there was a time where people would say, well, it's probably not a sin, but now marriage, that's between a man and a woman, and that idea changed. And then there was a time where we thought that gay marriage was the worst thing in the world, and now we've moved on to transgenderism, and gay marriage is not a big deal anymore. We, the world's standards change constantly, continuously, never stable. Friend, you need to settle your standards on the rock Jesus Christ and on nothing else build your life on the rock Jesus is the same yesterday today and forever he never changes he always settles he is always rock solid now here's what happens when we begin to compromise God's standards here's what happens first is this it is disproportionate he says Are you not partial in yourselves? You see, here's the thing. You and I don't have the ability to set the standards. To determine right and wrong and to judge other people by that, you and I don't have that ability. We don't have the... Here's what happens. When you and I start showing partiality to certain people and certain groups, we're going to honor those who aren't worthy of honor And we're going to dishonor those that God exalts. Verse 5 says this, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom? Here's what you're going to do. When you show partiality to any group, you have just diminished those that God exalts. Jesus Christ died for every person in this world. He wants to save every person. He wants to make them heirs of... God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. He wants to make them children of the King. They're going to live eternally in heaven and glory. They're going to rule and they're going to reign. They are adopted sons and daughters of God. All because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. And when you start showing partiality, you diminish a group that God exalts. 
Friend, you're working against God when you show partiality. You're also exalting a group that isn't worthy of it. If God doesn't show partiality, why do we think we can? What do we think gives us? If God's not going to exalt that group, why do we think we should? Imagine, if you will, imagine, if you will, a movie star walks in here and joins our service. How would you, how would you treat a movie star? Would you, what about a visitor that wasn't a movie star? And they were just wearing ratty jeans and a t-shirt. So er, y'all listening here just for a second. Everybody pay attention here for a second. If somebody is a guest at our church and nobody is talking to them, that is a spiritual emergency. Stop what you're doing. Find them and welcome them to church. And I don't care what they look like or frankly what they smell like. (laughs) If they're here, you need to make them feel welcome. I suspect if Brad Pitt, well, I don't know why I said Brad Pitt, I just the only movie star I could think of, but if Brad Pitt walked in here, at least most of the women in church would probably go welcome him. Isn't he like the handsomest guy in America or something? I, I suspect most people would go welcome Brad Pitt. What about everybody else? What, what if somebody not famous comes in? Would we welcome them just, just the same way we would if it was a movie star or a... How do we welcome? How do we welcome those that are unwelcomed in a lot of places in life? So we, we exalt those who aren't worthy of it. We lower those that God exalts. It's disproportionate. We get all of, all of it mixed up. It's also despised. Verse 5 says, this, Hearken, my beloved brethren... Hath God not chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which He hath promised to them that love Him? Verse 6, But ye have despised the poor. You've despised the poor. And He says here, Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seat? Alright, so He's saying... The people that mistreat you the most, those are the ones you're trying to win their favor. It's like middle school Christianity. And you want to be in the popular group. And you're trying your best to get in the popular group. And so you go buy the latest shoes, and you get the latest clothes. You spend $150 on a pair of blue jeans that have holes all in them. I don't understand it. But you go and you get the latest pair of blue jeans and you get the coolest shirt uh, because half of their proceeds uh, go to give people socks if you buy their shirt. And so uh, you, you spend all of the money on all the latest fads and you're trying to fit into the cool group when those are the people that are meanest to you in middle school. They're the ones that are rude to you. They're the ones that laugh at you, not just behind your back, but in front of everybody else. They mock you and they put you down. And you want to be friends with those people. And Christians can be the same way. We we want to win the favor of those who ridicule our faith, who mock us, who put us down and run us down. And we want to try to be like them and get our church to be like them. They're the ones that mistreat you. He says here the rich people are the ones that they're the ones that throw you in jail. And they're the ones you're trying to win the favor of. We, we do that so much with our faith. <laughs> it, and around here, here's, here's what you're going to find. You're going to find people that have disparaging things to say about black people and most everybody that's ever mistreated in their life was white that's just the truth of it 
That's just one partiality. We can show partiality a whole lot of ways. But we tend to run down people that don't really mistreat us much. It's the ones that we're trying to win the favor of. They're the ones that mistreat us. There's dishonor. Verse 7 says this, Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which ye are called? Now here's the worst part about it. It's bad enough that they put you down. The people that you're trying to please and impress and win by being like them. It's bad enough they put you down, but here's the worst thing about it. They also put down Jesus Christ. And we're supposed to be believers in Jesus, followers of Jesus Christ. We are, we are supposed to call Him Lord and Master. He is our Savior. We are live, supposed to live to please Him. And instead, we are living to try to win those and be like those that put Him down the most. Friend, listen to me. Don't ever try to be like those that put Jesus down. Now that is not to say that those who put down Jesus are not worthy of salvation. Do you hear me? Jesus died for everybody, even those that put Him down. Paul, the apostle, y'all know who I'm talking about? Paul went around winning people to Christ, serving as a missionary, and planting churches. But before he did that, he killed Christians and threw them in jail. And Jesus came and appeared to him and saved him. You know what Jesus didn't do? He didn't appear to Saul, who was killing Christians, and say, Yeah, I can understand why you feel that way. You know, we all struggle, and, and I think that if you'll just continue killing Christians, you'll work through and you'll finally come to faith. When Jesus appeared to Saul, he didn't try to become like Saul. He told Saul, I want you to become like me. And Saul became Paul. And one who persecuted Christians became one who won people to Christ. You will never win the world by trying to be like the world. Now, I know that is kind of easy for me to say because I live in the, I'm in a point in life and live in a place in life. I'm, I'm really not hip. And at this point in life, I'm pretty well settled with that conclusion. I'm really not hip. And I never will be. And I really don't. You know, when I lost my hair, I think at that point I was, lost all the ability to be hip anymore. But, uh, I, I I watched a pastor, he pastored a church in New York City. And I saw him on a TV show one day. And they were asking him really basic questions, tough questions for that venue, but really basic questions. Is homosexuality a sin? And instead of answering the question, he said, well, you know what I'd really like to do is I'd like to meet that person and sit down and talk with them and get to know them, find out where they're coming from. And he, that was his answer. And they asked him, is Jesus the only way to heaven? And he really wouldn't say. Friend, if you call yourself a follower of Christ, and someone asks you, is Jesus the only way to heaven, and you cannot give them a straight answer, you are no pastor. You are a false shepherd and leading people astray. And I don't care how hip you are. I don't care how cool you are. I don't care if you have the latest sunglasses and you have a really cool haircut. You are not winning people to Christ with a really cool haircut. And he waffled. And he's not the only pastor I've seen do that, by the way. Some of the most popular ch pastors in this country, when the people ask them, is Jesus the only way to heaven, they waffle. They refuse to answer. That is the question of Scripture. And you can't give the question, you can't answer that question, then what can you answer? What are you, what are you shepherding people toward? Where are you leading them? If you can't answer that question, strangely enough, the, the pastor I'm talking about is no longer in the ministry, no longer pastoring that church because it's discovered that he was actually cheating on his wife and had been for an awful long time. He wasn't leading people to Christ, that's for sure. 
You cannot live your faith trying to please other people. If you're living your faith, you, leave, you live it to please Jesus and nobody else. Sometimes, sometimes people worry about what I'll think of them if they make a spiritual decision and then maybe they think it's something that I don't agree with. It doesn't matter what I think. It matters what the Bible says. It matters what Jesus thinks. What I think really doesn't matter unless what I think lines up with what the Bible says. You live for Jesus and you don't worry about what anybody else says. You worry about what the Bible says and you live God's Word. Well, I'm going to stop there tonight. And uh, if you're going to live your faith for Jesus, the first step is you have to know Him. You have to be saved. Jesus Christ left the splendor and the glory of heaven where He was worshipped, served, and adored. He came to this earth, born a special, unique birth, a virgin birth. He lived a special, unique life, a sinless life, something you and I couldn't do, Jesus did. He died on the cross. And when he died, he died in your place and in my place. He took upon himself your sins and my sins. He rose from the dead. He is victorious over sin, death, hell, and the grave. He has ascended to the right hand of the Father. One day he is coming back to receive all those who believe in him unto himself. If you will ask Jesus, he will forgive you of your sins. He will save you and he will give you eternal life. That's what we call the church being saved. And that is the first step in Christianity. And if you've never done that, you can do that tonight. Maybe you're here, maybe you're watching this online. You have never asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins, to be the Lord of your life. You've never asked Him to save you. You can do that. I'm going to pray a prayer here tonight. You can pray this silently where you're at. The prayer goes like this. Jesus, I know I have sinned. I believe you died for my sins. I want you to save me from my sins. I believe you rose from the dead. I want to turn from my sins and I turn to you. I want you to be the Lord of my life. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Now help me to live for you. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, will you let me know? I want to talk with you and pray with you. Show you how to live for Jesus in this life. Show you how to live with Him in the life to come. And being saved is not the end. It's the beginning. Maybe you're here and there is another spiritual decision you need to make. You've been saved, but there's some sin in your life and you need to repent of that sin and rededicate your life to Jesus. Maybe some other decision. Maybe you want to join a church. Maybe you want to be baptized. You've been saved and you want to follow the Lord in baptism or maybe something else. Maybe you just need to be at this altar praying. Whatever decision you need to make, we're going to have a hymn of invitation. Carolyn's going to play a hymn tonight. If the Lord is speaking to your heart, there's a decision you need to make. You step out and come.